Sorry, I'm difficult. Okay, cue me when we're ready. Oh, don't do that to me, please. I will come back there and choke you with a camera. Okay. Um, Welcome to Current Election Technologies and How to Better Secure Computerized Voting Machines. First, we'll start with an abridged history of the past election technologies and the difference between them. As a whole, really the only way you can develop a newer, more secure platform is to understand the past methods and the problems that we've had with them, because you really can't fix something if you don't know it's broken. Uh, there have been numerous and diverse methods used in the past. These are just the generic topics. Uh, the paper-based electronic voting system, sometimes called document ballot voting systems, started out as a system where everything was cast and counted by hands using actual physical paper medium. With the advent of electronic tabulation, this evolved into a system where you marked it on paper, but the computer actually tabulated it. Uh, direct record voting systems. Use, where's my? Oh crap! There we go. Yeah. Welcome to technical difficulties. Direct record voting systems record ballots using a displayed ballot on a mechanical or electrical op optical component. Something like you touch it and the screen will show you your ballot. This kind of system processes data using a computer. It records the votes as digital images in its memory, sort of like screenshots. Uh, Post-election, it will produce a tabulation of the voter data that has been stored in removable memory, usually a compact flash card, and then it will be, you can make a printed copy of it. This system really gained popularity in 2002 due to the Help America Vote Act's mandate that says one handicapped accessible voting system must be provided for every polling place, and most jurisdictions satisfied it by using a DRE. Some opted to switch over entirely just to ensure compliance, but by 2004, about 30% of registered U.S. voters had used some sort of DRE system. Uh, a public network DRE system is just simply that, a DRE that transmits its vote data over a public network, i.e. the internet. Vote data can be transmitted as both, as each ballot's cast, everybody that pushes vote it sends it, periodically as lumps throughout the day, like every hour it updates on TV, or every three hours, or at noon, or as a complete batch at the end of the day where they close at eight, and at eight this whole lump of ballots is sent. In Switzerland, it's established as part of their local referendums. Voters are issued passwords, and they can access with their, their country ID through their postal service. In Estonia, people cast their votes, if they choose to, over an e-voting system on the internet. Everyone's given a national ID card, their uh, government-issued PIN number, and they go to a public place like the library or the post office, and you swipe your public, you swipe your national ID, put your PIN number in, and you can vote there up to 10 days before the election. Optical scan voting systems work similar to a Scantron system if you've ever had to do those in school, where the voters will darken an oval next to the name of their candidate and they feed it into a reader which will then count the number of marked ovals and tabulate it to that candidate's total. Now that we have an overview of the differences, we can discuss the companies that provide them. Please work. Diebold election systems, everyone's heard of them, has had some scandals in the past. The election systems made by Diebold are responsible for tallying about 80% of votes cast in the U.S. There are system software that tabulates it. They call it GEM Central Tabulator. Uh, the version 1.18 of that counted most of the votes for 2004's presidential, con uh, presidential election, which led to the controversy of voter regularities. They claimed that it was not the hardware, it was the software. In 2006, Diebold made a decision that they would remove their name from the top, you know, where it displays that they would remove it to boost voter confidence, because if voters didn't know Diebold made the machines, they might be more inclined to trust them. In August of 2007, the company tried to reinvent themselves to voters and called themselves Premier Election Solutions. Sounds all fancy, really isn't. Sequoia Voting Systems is one of the largest providers of electronic voting systems in the United States. They are the chief competitor to Premier. They were the first to introduce something called Voter Verified Paper Audit Trails, or a VVPAT system, in the U.S. The company was purchased by Smartmatic on March 8th of 2005, but they didn't change their name to go with it. They claim that they have the world's only fully secure and fully auditable voting technology today. Related to that is the fact that Sequoia Voting Systems was implicated by their former employees in a hanging Chad scandal 
because of rumors that they intentionally manufactured poor quality paper ballots for West Palm Beach, Florida. Election systems and software was the result of a corporate merger between American Information Systems and Business Records Corp in 1980. At the root, they're actually owned by the Omaha World Herald Corporation, the publisher of Nebraska's largest newspaper. They claim to be the largest manufacturer of voting machines in the U.S. They have customers in 1,700 localities, although they only have 350 employees. They still claim revenues of 117 million annually. Funny thing I noticed is Senator Chuck Hagel used to be the CEO of ESS up until their company provided voting equipment for the 1996 Senate elections. Now he's Senator Chuck Hagel. The state of Indiana launched an inquiry into the machines, which was settled when the company paid the state $750,000 in hush money to make it go away. West Virginia and Arkansas also tried to pursue cases against them, but the company denied any problem with machines and cited errant poll workers. It's not us, it's the users. Their Incavote Plus optical system was revoked for use in California just five months after they initially approved it. They didn't state a reason, they just said it was revoked. Which brings us to Heart InterCivic, their privately held U.S. company headquartered in Texas that provide the replacement for California. They're, pro they're the producers of the eSlate system. It's a DRE sol voting solution specifically designed to accommodate disabled voters. It provides a select wheel similar to what's on an iPod today and a digital push button interface as opposed to a touchscreen solution. Something like the, uh, anybody who gets gas at Sam's Club, it's the same interface. Um, on August 3rd, 2007, their systems replaced the Incavote Plus system in California. But on December 15th, a report commissioned by the state of Ohio found that one of the heart inner civic machines used in the state had some critical flaws which could undermine the integrity of the entire 2008 general election for that state. Therefore, it was immediately decommissioned in Ohio and California until further testing is done. There are some advantages and disadvantages to everything. Some advantages, MIT's Charles Stewart estimated that up to one million more ballots were counted in 2004 as opposed to in 2000 because electronic voting machines detected votes that paper-based machines would have missed. People who didn't fill in the circle dark enough, people who did an X instead of filling it in, people who misspelled their candidate's name, anything. It's being argued that theoretically humans are not equipped to verify operations occurring within an electronic machine. And because of that, the operations can't be trusted. Further, computing experts argue that true programmers can't trust any program they didn't author themselves. Under a secret ballot system, there's no known input. So whatever output you get, you have nothing to compare it against. So the accuracy, the honesty, the security, the entire electronic system can be verified by humans. Electronic voting systems store ballots digit in digital form in memory. This method is used exclusively by the DRE machines that you see every time you go to vote today. When electronic ballots are used, there's no need to print any paper ballots, so there's no risk of running out of ballots or you know, having to throw them away and feel bad about the cost wasted in the waste paper. This also allows ballots to be offered in multiple languages using one machine instead of one for each language which is only, honestly enough required by the National Voting Rights Act of 1965. For example, King County, Washington, because of their demographics, are required under U.S. federal election law to provide ballot access in Chinese. This means they need to decide how many Chinese language ballots they have to print, how many to put in each polling place they could run out, and then if they don't use them, it's wasted paper they throw away. The National Voting Rights Act of 1965, we abbreviate it as the Voting Rights Act, outlaws the requirement that would-be voters have to pass a literacy test before they can register to vote, and for, provides federal registration of voters in areas with less than 50% of eligible minority voters registered. This act implies that it established an explicit right to vote for any U.S. citizen. However, there's no federal right. For example, ex-felons cannot vote. Instead, it grants you a fundamental right. If you don't screw up, we'll let you vote. Your incentive not to screw up. Because of this, we now have the Help America Vote Act call it HAVA. It has three goals, to replace punch card voting machines with computerized ones. They created the Election Assistance Commission, which establishes the uh, Federal Elections Administration to have standards. 
And it mandates that all states and localities must upgrade their aspects of election procedures, including voting machines, registration processes, and how they train their poll workers. There are no specifics. They pretty much leave it up to every state to do their own thing. The Americans with Disabilities Act demands that you have handicapped access in at least one voting booth in every voting precinct. However, there are studies that show the voting rate among people with disabilities is about 20 percentage point less than that of non-disabled people because there are 20,000 polling places in the, in the nation that are inaccessible. They have stairs, they don't have adequate voting booths, they're too high, whatever. Therefore, they're depriving disabled people of their fundamental right to vote. The Verified Voting Foundation advocates use of, whoa, what the heck? I'm sorry, I did not, what the heck happened here? I told it to fall. Why is it doing this? Shoot it, please. Bang. Yeah, thanks. The Verified Voting Foundation advocates the use of voter verified paper ballots for all elections in the U.S. so that voters can inspect their individual permanent records of their ballots before they're cast. So basically, you go up to the machine, you get a little printout before you push the vote button. You can compare what's printed on the printout to what you have on the screen before you push the vote button so you can go, wait, I screwed up. Open Voting Consortium was born of the problem of broken voting. It began during the 2000 election debacle. It was started by Jim Welsh, with the proof one man can make a difference, who was voting and saw his selections on the touchscreen machine change before his eyes. He called the election official over, who gave him two options. One, he could complete his ballot on the defective machine and go away happy. Or two, cancel out his ballot, start all over again on the same defective machine. He was never given an option to try a different machine. This really degraded his confidence in the current electronic voting architecture and led him to band together with other people who felt the same way. They support the open voting, which strives for two things. The entire voting system must be open to public scrutiny. You, there's no trade secrets, there's no, we'll give you half the code, it's all or nothing. A paper ballot or receipt you need has to be something that can be handled, stacked, counted, recounted, something physical you put in a table that you can say, here's what I did. They currently have a beta version of open source voting software based off Ubuntu called OVC that was a prototype for electronic machines that were designed by Ka Ping Yi that's a summary ballot printing and tabulation routine. I actually have a demo of it if you want to come up afterwards and see it. Now we can take a more in-depth look at some of the new voting technologies available today. Prime 3 was developed by the Human Centered Computing Lab of Auburn University in 2005. It's a secure, open source, multimodal electronic voting system that's able to deliver necessary system interface that accommodates all people regardless of technical ability. It implements what they call the universal design. It's the product that's designed to be used in every environment by as many people as possible, regardless of your age, your ability, your situation. It's barrier free. It's made so that people who, it can be used by people who are illiterate, people, the, the blind, the deaf, the physically disabled, anybody. You can walk up to it and vote. Punch scan is touted as the first vote capture system that offers fully end to end verifiable results for the election beyond just paper and audit trails. The entire punch scan election process is said to be so easy that the in instructions can be printed on one side of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and displayed at every polling place. End to end cryptographic independent verification is the mechanism built into an election that allows voters to take that piece of paper ballot home with them as a receipt that says, I voted, here's my proof. It doesn't allow you to prove how you voted. It just proves that you did vote. And it's to, it verifies with some amount of accuracy that the votes were counted properly. If you end up with 1,000 people with a piece of paper, there better be 1,000 votes in the computer. Somebody screwed up if there isn't. Scantegrity is an integrity assurance add-on that works for conventional optical scan voting systems. It gives the voters the ability to verify their votes were recorded and tallied correctly without altering the basic form of the ballot or how they use it. It works by sticking... Uh, special audit symbols in, into, unobtrusively into the ballot printing, out of the way of the actual ballot information, but it's there. As you can see by my little man in the corner, 
more and more people are concerned if their votes are counting or if it's a total crap shoot. If you can't read it in the back, it says, now I kneel me down to cast an, ele an electronic vote I pray will last. And if the election should be in doubt, I pray this machine, my vote will count. Some places are putting that concern aside and experimenting with distance balloting. Operation Bravo Foundation aims to foster a grassroots exploration and development of practical and repro reproducible electronic solutions that can significantly improve overseas absent voting processes. Okaloosa County, Florida is home to 20,000 active duty military and their dependents. This is a very high concentration of overseas military voters and it means that the county's election officials are highly motivated to find a better way to manage today's methods because it doesn't count if the mail didn't get to them. Numerous overseas balloting pilot programs were started but they never moved beyond the experimental phase because other counties and other precincts never had a use for them. The intent is to have a new distance balloting system in place by the 2008 presidential election with express intention of developing a solution that could be subsequently administered throughout the United States. A secure and scalable distance ballot environment will be established for up to 900 self-selecting overseas voters who are registered in Okaloosa County. The pilot, the pilot program will position remote electronic voting kiosks in three overseas locations, uh, UK, Germany, and Japan. These kiosks are open for 10 days prior to the election and will be administered by county election officials using a proven, transparent, and secure electronic remote voting technology over VPN. I went to get information from them. I emailed their, their election office. I got no response. The votes are then delivered to a secure county server for official tally. No paper, no mail, no hassle, no waiting, and you get a receipt that simply says your ballot has been cast, similar to the sticker you get when you walk out of the polling place. This is the first real concrete mention of true verification through cryptography using a VPN. Systems that allow voters to verify their vote is recorded and then tabulated with an appropriate mathematical calculation will alleviate concerns that their vote has not been recorded correctly. You get an electronic receipt signed by the voting authority using a digital signature, will conclusively prove the accuracy of the tally, but can't guarantee your anonymity. The voter's choice can, might be listed on there, which is an enabler for voter intimidation and vote selling. There are some solutions that aim to let the voter verify their vote personally, but a third party wouldn't have that ability. This would be done by tagging each vote with this individual session ID, which then matches the electronic vote session ID, so that you can present your piece of paper and they can match it up to the one in the computer and go, yep, your vote's here and it's what you said it was. Machines are able to provide immediate feedback to voters, which can then aid in overvoting or undervoting, which causes an errant ballot total. If your piece of paper does not match what's in the computer, somebody needs to go back and fix it. In order to protect against hidden agendas, many groups want transparency. The biggest one is the United Kingdom's Open Rights Group. They, their purpose, they're not just an e-voting group. Their purpose is to preserve digital rights and the people's freedoms by making people aware of digital rights issues. They put journalists in contact with experts so that there's that, that grassroots activist mentality. Their biggest com campaigns involve digital rights management, extension of copyright to sound recordings, and e-voting security. The organization was formed based on a panel discussion held at Open Tech 2005, the con great conference. Uh, several people illustrated there was a serious interest towards change and therefore got together and said, hey, let's do this. More proof that one person can make a difference. There is a major forefront in pushing for transparency of voting practices as well as strengthening privacy and human dignity through the opposition of automatic vehicle tracking, communication data retention, and RFID chipping. Anybody who got a passport recently, you've been chipped. A complete audit trail should be available in addition. Where is my audit trail? There's my audit trail. Voter, voter verified paper audit trail, VVPAT. Yeah, that's where I am, isn't it? Yeah. I just had a total blank out moment. Also called verified paper record is designed as an independent verification system for voting machines. It's designed to permit voters to check if their vote was cast correctly which then aids in detection of election fraud or mal machine malfunction. However, this has problems too. Videos taken documenting voter behavior on election day shows that most voters didn't verify their choices. 
Some of them never even took the receipt out of the machine and walked away. Manual recount and audit using a VVPAT system is labor intensive and highly costly, so most candidates who might want it probably can't afford it. The creator is Dr. Rebecca Mercury, and she described it in her PhD dissertation as the proposed answer to the auditability question through having the voting machine print paper ballots or other paper facsimiles that can be visually verified by the voter before being entered into the secure location. They call it the Mercury method. End-to-end -end auditable voting, voting systems provide independent verification through the storage of a digital ballot using a cryptographic method. It gets stored to a hard drive, it gets encrypted. As soon as it's stored, nobody else gets to see it. This provides voters with a receipt that allows them to verify their vote is included in the tally and that all votes cast are done so by valid registered voters. That Joe Schmo off the street from another precinct didn't walk into your precinct and cast a ballot. Two quotes you see here are written from an NSA, NIST draft regarding electronic voting. The first is from the actual draft. The second is an explanation of the first that was required after people claimed it could be misinterpreted. Personally, I think the second one is just as vague and misinterpretable as the first. Auditing could be a stepping stone to see if any vote tampering had pl taken place. How many, reckon, how many people know what these are? Before I trip over that, how many people know what those are? Thank you. The image you see here is courtesy of Diebold's online store. Anyone who so desires can purchase a key to unlock any Diebold touchscreen voting console. You don't even need to prove that you work for the voting precinct. You can just go in, throw in a credit card number, ta-da, keys. People have had keys made based on this picture and two others found online that are yeah. more detailed. Wonderful security. Rumored, also hotel minibars, minibar keys will work. So great, you can get drunk One and then go with the voting machine. machine. Fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> Inadequately secured hardware is subject to physical tampering, which includes the insertion of foreign hardware. This could allow for man-in-the-middle style attack, which means even sealing them isn't sufficient. Some groups counterclaim that with a proper review and testing procedures, they can detect this fraudulent code or fraudulent hardware. The further they go on to say, there needs to be a chain of custody. Theoretically, this would eliminate the possibility until you get one person in the chain of custody who has malicious intent and your chain of custody just disintegrated on the floor. Some security experts have demanded that voting machine source code should be made publicly available. You can go in and inspect it. Others suggest publishing it under a free software license, similar to what they do in Australia. In Australia, you can go up to your voting precinct office, say, I want to see the source code for this machine. And they will produce you a three-ring binder with all the source code in it for your review. And if you ask a question, they are obligated to answer it. In order to thoroughly prevent against all the problems we've discussed, there are methods of certification and testing for these machines. Parallel testing involves randomly selecting voting machines from election day and ensuring that they yield the same results. They walk into a state, you know, one machine from precinct A, one machine from precinct B, one machine from precinct X. They feed them a thousand votes. They get a thousand results. They better match the votes they put in the machine. In the U.S., there is no mandatory federal certification for voting machines. They leave each state up to policing their own crap. I use that term lightly, and it's a technical term. <laughs> the U.S. Election Assistance Commission has assumed federal responsibility for accrediting vote system testing labs and certifying the voting equipment through what's called the Voting System Certification and Laboratory Accreditation Program. Their goal is to independently verify that voting systems comply with functional capabilities. Okay. Doors opening randomly behind me. Creepy. It could be a back door. <laughs> yeah, just, just what we need in a voting conference, another back door. To ensure that er not every lab can apply for accreditation, the NIST recommends labs for accreditation through another program called the National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program. You can't just call them up on the phone and say, I have a lab, where's my paper, I want to sign it. Doesn't work that way. Oddly enough, the ACM published a document, and you can get it from that link there if you'd like, entitled, Small Vote Manipulations Can Swing Elections. My cursor's hiding. <coughs> they determined that they could change the output of the 2000 U.S. presidential election if they changed two votes in every precinct. Whenever you think of vote tampering, you think they change an entire precinct's votes to the other candidate. Not the case. There's a 3% give or take error percentage for every precinct. If you read, read the vote results on TV, you'll see it in the corner. 
Some of them are 4%, depends on your state. They determined that 90% of total votes cast were done through computerized voting machines. The remaining 10 were done through some sort of paper method, which doesn't count towards the e-voting total. They said that each machine contains a number of ballots for candidate A that will be changed to votes for candidate B. Call that, well, they called it M. Big, ugly mathematical problem. They, one machine is required for every certain number of votes cast in a precinct. They, they use the number 200. It's kind of just they pulled it out of their ass. This gives about each voter four and a half minutes to cast their ballot if they take their time and read all the menus. The number of voting machines required per, per, per precinct would then be 90% times the number of total votes cast divided by the number of voters. According to the records, there were uh, 184,394 voting precincts in the 2000 election, which works out to be an average of about 572 votes per precinct. And when they did the math, they determined that one a malicious person would only have to change two votes per precinct in the states of Florida, New Mexico, and Iowa to change the entire presidential election outcome. Three states, that's all it takes. There is a possible solution that would ensure the security of electronic voting platform that's being researched by the trusted computing group related to platform security. And I will hand it off to you. All right. One moment. Can we get the other mic turned on, please? Would be easier. Hello? Here. This is not designed for two speakers. Generally, no. How's that? Much better. Okay. The primary goal of the Trusted Computing Group, uh, it's a nonprofit organization here. Um, their primary goal is to help users protect their information assets like data, password, keys, etc., from compromise due to foreign code insertion or theft. She does that a lot. <laughs> uh, the organization was defined in such a way to enable broad participation, efficient management, and widespread adoption of their specifications, notably that of the Trusted Platform Module, the TPM, as well as the Trusted Network Connect specifications. Um, they have other uh, specifications as well related to storage uh, and other non-computing uses located at the trustedcomputinggroup.org. Uh, we believe that a combination of these two specifications uh, could be the beginnings, just the beginnings now, of a possible solution uh, for insecure electronic voting. Uh, for the sake of time constraints, we will only be addressing the trusted plat uh, platform module as it relates to hardware and software security. The TPM is a microcontroller that stores keys, passwords, and digital certificates. It is affixed to the motherboard in a way that it functions below the bias level to ensure a secure boot environment for a system which could be used to prevent foreign and or untrusted code execution on an electronic voting platform. Access to the platform could be denied if the boot sequence was not as expected. If foreign hardware that was not present at last boot is detected, on the current boot or if foreign code is executed that causes the hash value of any file on the boot checklist to change. Systems with the TPM chips offer hardware-based security for numerous applications including file and folder encryption, password management, VPN and VP VKI authentication, and wireless authentication for the AO21X specifications. This would help ensure voting machines that report their results via a VPN or an encrypted channel over a public network would remain secure in the event an attacker would make an attempt to sniff or alter the network traffic. TPMs are provided in various discrete and integrated forms through Atmel, Broadcom, Infineon, Sinosun, and ST Microsystems, and Winbon. They are designed to work in desktop, notebook, tablet PC, and server architectures. Currently, Dell, Fujitsu, Gateway, HP, Intel, and Lenovo openly admit to carrying models which have TPMs built onto the motherboard by default. As part of the specification, they have designed the TPM so that vendors can package it or provide uh, input-output methods suitable for inclusion in systems other than PCs and quite possibly into electronic voting platforms. Let's look a bit closer then at the actual algorithmic specifications. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, asymmetric key functions are for on-chip 
key pair generation using a hardware random number generator, uh, private key signatures, and public key encryption. This provides private key detection, which enables more secure storage of files and digital secrets. There is hardware-based protection for the symmetric key associated with software-encrypted files and for the private keys used for digital signatures. The random number generator is used to create keys and perform operations on private keys, which are protected by the TPM even while in use. Secure storage of hash values through a series of platform control registers, or PCRs for short, allow them to use as secure reporting of certain variables. Hashes created through the inventory of the system hardware and through a list of files checked at boot are stored using PCRs. Now that we know what algorithms it uses and what it's capable of working with, you're probably wondering what operating systems it's compatible with. Several members of the uh, Trusted Computing Group have designed Linux-based software stacks to extend compatibility among a variety of operating systems. There are specifications for trusted servers, trusted mobile devices, trusted storage, and therefore a trusted infrastructure that are being worked towards finalization as we speak. The Trusted Computing Group design does not have any requirement that software be certified by any organization. For example, how Microsoft uses uh, verified drivers. The idea is that it be so flexible that it can be used on a variety of platforms and through a variety of software to secure record data and to secure storage and digital and signed digital keys. And there are complements that can be used in addition to the TPM for security purposes. Smart cards and biometrics are considered fixed tokens that are used to enhance user authentication, data, communications, and or platform security. Microsoft's BitLocker drive encryption is designed specifically to make use of a TPM chipset. The PC client specifications developed by the Trusted Computing Group are used to protect critical system files and user data to help ensure that a computer running Windows Vista has not been tampered with while offline. For this to work properly, the TPM must be of a specification version 1.2 and the system's BIOS must meet those specifications as well. It is possible to use the BitLocker without a TPM if you store the keys on a flash drive. However, this is not the preferred configuration, nor was it designed to be the typical uses. How many people have found it a um, USB flash drive or lost one? The TPM is designed to be secure through a series of authentications done at the lower levels of the boot process. The TPM provides a for secure storage and key generation capabilities, which it uses to create and or store both user and platform identity credentials for authentication use. The TPMs have the ability to protect and authenticate user passwords, which provides an effective solution of integrating store strong authentication directly into the computing platform. If combined with one of the complements we discussed in the previous slides, the TPM has the potential to enable true machine and user authentication. We thank you for listening, and at this time, we'd like to entertain any questions, comments, or concerns that you may have. Go ahead. Okay, let, let me handle this one at a time. First, their first comment. Uh, the paper was, if, if you actually go out and go through it, it's about three pages long in really small print. It covers the difference between where, as most people consider vote tampering to be, an entire precinct is changed. This was, if you change a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there, that's within the error rating, within that 3%, give or take, 
that it would go more unnoticed than if a whole precinct's ballots were changed from candidate A to candidate B. It's not as much as, it's not so much towards the actual vote tampering, but towards if you do it a little here and a little there, it'll really go unnoticed. And your second comment, this, the TPM architecture is really more geared towards systems that aren't going to be modified a lot. They're pretty much static from the day they're built because with the, like for example, the trusted boot sequence, if you set it up and then three weeks later change a stick of RAM or add it, change the processor, it changes the hash value of the hardware and then when it boots it will tell you that the hash values have changed. You can still boot, but it won't be secure and you won't have access to any of the keys or passwords stored on it. It would be easier to use I agree with you, they probably use the same password for all of them, but what really would be easier is if they used a different one that was, they entered something into the unit and it would be similar, but the hash would be different. It, would, it really needs to be looked into a lot more. This is just pretty general because a lot of the information, the companies never got back to us if we asked a question, mm -hmm. and a lot of them did not make their information publicly available as to whether or not they would consider this. In addition to this, if I wanted to say something here for a moment, the fact that Diebold uh, went public with their key to their open uh, their election technology like this, it makes you wonder how easy their ATMs are, as well as some of their other high security products they make. I mean, their ATMs, really their ATMs are in Windows. Hello, foot. Here's the gun. Shoot. Yes, I know. I've seen the blue screen of death mm -hmm. on an ATM. Yes. Right. Are not particularly well versed or interested in information security. Apparently not. <laughs> That's why it's designed to be fairly simple and fairly flexible. That it doesn't take a whole lot to make it work, but once it's in place, it's really secure. There are literally, I can give you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages on specifications for this thing that are really broken down at technical level, and then one or two papers where they made it really simple and stupid that anybody in middle school could read it and understand the concepts. It All those technical papers, by the way, are available at the trustedcomputinggroup.org. They have a, a library similar to the SANS reading room that you can just sit there and go through humongous PDF documents at your leisure. Trust me, I've read them. It's not fun. It's about four <laughs> pots of coffee worth. Anybody else? Poor design goes it to or, begin with, with most or, of them. Or was it so that we can generate plausible deniability? I'm not really sure on the plausible deniability. Most of it is uh, lazy coders. I hate to blame them, but a lot of it is because the um, I was provided with a book that has some of the code in it for the actual voting machines, and a lot of them was they wrote them and didn't write any. Um, verifying stuff, like they didn't verify any of their input. They did a lot of code that was very sloppy. They did a lot of it with a lot of comments, so it's great if you get a hold of it because you know exactly what they're doing and where they didn't do it. More of it for pl plausible deniability, uh, that's arguable depending upon what the problem was. But well, I think, I think the, the problem in the last eight years is that the presidential election has been too close to call. And right, and, and there is... Right, mm -hmm. and it's pretty much blamed on. Dave and episode two was Hamilton. Right, and mm -hmm. instead of taking responsibility and saying, okay, it could be our hardware, it could be our software, we'll look at it, they go, it's errant poll workers, it's your fault, not ours. I just don't think they want to get involved because then it would come to light all of their sloppy coding techniques and all of their actual internal problems, and then they'd be in more hot like water. Like locksmith. Then they'd be in more hot water than they are now. It all depends on how you look at the situation as far as from whose perspective it is. They're trying to make it so they can't blame themselves, and everybody's pointing the finger at them anyway. They're going to get it in the end. So admit it, somebody's going to come out and show, hey, this is wrong and we can prove it, and then they're going to be standing there caught with their pants down. Well, yeah, look, the point of plausible deniability, I'm, I'm not stuck on it or anything. It's just that, you know, yeah. they, you know, it, it, is it set up this way so that so that the system is easy to break, so that anyone can break it, and the person who actually sets out to break it, you can't find them, because anybody could have done it. 
I, do, I really don't know. That is something to look into. That mm -hmm. will be, we'll, we will look into that for future airings of this speech. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, did we, did we break it on purpose so that anyone could break it? Well, the if we wanted to break it. If you go out, sure. there is a video produced by Harvard that's available on YouTube. It's also available on their website. If you've seen it, they take a standard Diebold voting machine. I think it's the AccuVote TS, mm -hmm. the white edition. And in 15 seconds or left, have it broken into, and over the next 30 minutes, dissect it onto a table with all of the pieces and parts and explain to you exactly why it's vulnerable and what pieces shouldn't be there. Like, for example, the one they had in the video, I believe, had PCMSA memory card slot that wasn't in use, so why did they bother putting it on there? And another model that they looked at had Bluetooth and wireless built in, and they're not using it on a publicly sniffable network, so why is it there? A lot of it is bad design. Best I can say. Anyone? The anybody lights, else? lights blinding me. Is anybody back anybody there? Anybody back there have a question? No? Okay, thank you. If you'd like, there's a forum and some discussion information available at the website and the screen. It's fa fairly new, so there's not a lot on it, but we'd love to have you join us on it. And there are email addresses if you have questions later. Yes? I have a question. Okay. There are actually the some. There are some that. Are. There are actually uh, yeah. some people who are already. A lot of it. A, comes a device down. would have to be built from the ground up right. to include uh, security from the beginning. I mean, it would have to be basically designed stricter than Fort Knox even from the ground up, including hardware, including proprietary keys, proprietary screws in the cases themselves. Um, that's the problem. Everybody has their own specification. Everybody's going off in every, every which way. There's, there's no federal blanket rule that says it has to be this way, and if you don't do it this way, we will come and get you. And a lot of it that the people don't go knocking on the congressman's door at 3 in the morning complaining about this is that either A, they don't know, or B, they don't think it in involves them and therefore they don't care. I actually was supposed to do this, I'll be honest with you, as a, my senior project for college. And I had my professor tell me that this had absolutely nothing to do with her, and therefore she didn't care about it. <laughs> and I thought, did you, okay, I asked, did you vote in the last election? Yeah. Then this involves you. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, it doesn't specifically involve me, so I don't care. And a lot of it is the people going, does, it be, does anything benefit me? No? Okay, I'm leaving. I voted for the guy that won, so it's not my problem. Right. And if you voted for the guy that lost, you're standing there screaming, it must be the machine. It must be. And I, I know people that have done this, and it comes, basically comes down to they don't care. If it's not something that is going to directly affect them, it's somebody else's problem. It's the congressman's problem, or it's the senator's problem. They don't realize that the only thing the senator is going to do is what the people tell him to do. You have to go to the office, write, write a letter, make a phone call, bug him until he does something. Say, this, this affects me. I want it fixed. Mm -hmm. Because one person really does make a difference, even though you don't think so. Even though somebody goes, I can't do this. It's, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. It does. If you bitch enough, you'll get what you want. It's basically That's the trick if you Basically what enough. it boils down to, you have to be enough of pain in their ass, they want to get rid of you, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yes? I guess on the workable solution problem. Yeah, the light is. I would argue the most workable solution is to forego the whole electronic thing altogether. I mean, the only real reason for this is that we're in this culture of, we want results We are an instant gratification community. Yeah. Have you ever taken the CISSP? Yes. They get pencil and paper, and there's a reason for that, because they don't trust you not to try and pull something. Right. Why should the election, which is a lot more important, be any different? I mean, it's, there's a lot more logistics involved. So, I mean, you'd have to bribe a lot more people to cheat in a presidential election. Right. Uh, a lot of it comes down to, and there's a term for it, and I forget the term offhand, it was discussed in one of my classes. We are a, a people that if there is a new technology out, we want it now. New cell phone, got to go get it right now. New computer, got to go run out and buy it right now. And if there's new hardware off, out there, everybody's going to go, oh, we have to go buy it right now. They don't want to look at the current method and go, okay, let's fix this. So don't throw it aside and move on. Let's fix the problem, like the hanging chads problem. Let's fix the problem. No, they chose to create a whole different problem.
That's why you get really good grant writers, and you make them per persuade the people into it. Well, I think one problem with, like, the reason we have to have instant results is there's a multi-billion dollar news industry built around this stuff. Well, what look at you're doing is telling a lot of people to forego billions of dollars in instant election 3D. This operation. is this is why I mentioned the one uh, voting company that's owned by Nebraska's largest newspaper. A lot of it is they know they're going to get more business to people to buy their voting machines if they push it in the media. And it, it, they didn't explicitly say it, but I kind of thought it was a little odd that they were owned by a newspaper corporation that primarily covers election results. It was sort of like, okay, if we push this new hardware, people will buy it and we'll get more money. With the American Idol effect. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. Everybody falls into it. Do you know that more, more people voted for the last American Idol than did in the 2004 presidential elections? That it was more important to vote for American Idol than it was vote for president? You could vote for American Idol from your cell phone. Yeah. Now, okay, someday in the future, they might Im implement voting for president via your cell phone. God, I hope not. God, I hope not, too. But, but if they try to design such a system, then it should be designed from the ground up to be as secure as possible right. and securable. This is true. Yeah. I mean, so what if your favorite idol doesn't win? There's, yeah, no, there's, no, big, there's no big consequence to your favorite idol not winning. But we all know what will happen if the wrong president gets elected. Right. It it's all comes down to what you believe in and whether you're motivated enough to change it. I don't think that anybody's really motivated enough to change something that's broken. They want to start with a whole different architecture and create a whole other series of problems because they were too lazy to deal with the original problem in the first place. And that's why there's the whole concept of you have to understand the problem and why you have the problem before you can fix it. Because you can't fix it if you don't know it's broken. With enough money and uh, technology, you can fix any process problem. You're right, but there's, mm -hmm. your, there's the problem, money. Because nobody wants to give up money if they don't know what the problem is. Or some company's got an inside um, uh, record or something like that, an inside lead on developing so a solution to a problem. Okay, we're... Right, exactly. Some people don't want to deal with the current issue. They want something new to forget about the old issue. They don't want you to redesign this car. They want an entirely new And they don't want, like, like cars, they don't want you to fix the problem. They want you to buy a new one. I would argue that there really isn't a problem with the state-of-the-state thing. You mentioned the hanging chairs. That was one problem. But there has to be software to run those optical scans. But a scan, but by the same token, he's right. A Scantron machine is more reliable than an mm -hmm. electronic voting machine because you've got mm -hmm. a pile of paper when you're done. You can go, I had this many votes for A. Now I can sit here and go through all the paper stacks and count up the number of mm -hmm. votes. You're right. I wish more people had his opinion. Mm. You have to go back to the people that actually count the paper ballots. You have to have trustworthy people count.